Perfect and welcome. I'm just going to get the transcript going. I, I neglected to do that. So we have have that up and running. So hopefully you can see that and we'll uh, have that available. All right. Well, welcome back um, to our Inclusive Practices in Action. Uh, this has been wonderful two days um, with all of our educators yesterday and administrators today. Um, and I so appreciate all of your active engagement. Um, these last couple of days, this morning has been just tremendous and asking questions and asking for clarification. And that is precisely what that chat box is there for you to do. So please engage, ask questions. Um, if there are additional questions of the panel, um, you may ask them in the chat box. This is a fantastic group today of just rock star administrators who are, are doing amazing things. At, at their local level. Um, and so we are really grateful to have them and I'll introduce them in a minute. But we have some set questions. Um, we'll kind of bounce off of those. But if you have specific questions, please add those to the chat box and we'll do our best to address those um, just throughout this, this next 45 minutes. So thanks for joining. Um, we're excited to be here. If you don't know me, my name is Meredith Keedy Merck. Um, I'm the director of Project Success. Um, and this is just a little bit of my background um, as, as well as being a special educator and an administrator, I've been with this team for six years and I'm very proud of the work of Project Success. Um, in my other job, I'm mom of these two and, and um, they're wild and crazy. So glad to always put their picture in there and we always do that as a team. Um, if you have not done so already, we want to hear and see you on social media. We have a Twitter account at Project Success 4. Um, and our Facebook is Project Success IN, as in Indiana. And we would love for you to post a lesson learned, um, highlight a great presentation, quote one of our speakers, uh, quote one of our panelists today, um, and share that out. Um, uh, make sure you highlight kind of your next steps there. This is a time and a space to just um, amplify what we've done these last few days and, and have your voice out there and included in that. So please uh, feel comfortable doing that and, and we'll encourage you to, to share on those spaces as well. So without further ado, I wanna take a moment to begin um, an introduction to our panel of administrators. Um, I'm gonna ask that our panels, panelists jump on to camera um, so that we have everyone there and that you can see who our panelists are today. Um, and then I will go left to right um, to have our panelists introduce themselves and share just a little bit of, of their background um, so and their expertise as well. So Anne, would you mind kicking us off today? Absolutely. My name is Anne Higgins and I'm the Director of Special Education for Wabash Miami Area Program. I'm finishing up my eighth year as Director um, and we service five um, school corporations in a very rural part of North Central Indiana. If you draw a line between Kokomo and Fort Wayne, we're kind of right in the middle. Perfect. Thank you, Anne. And Heather, Heather Paskus. Hey, I'm Heather Paskus, the Director of Exceptional Education, um, Crown Point Schools, which is the southern part of Northwest Indiana. Um, this is my second year in Crown Point for several years. Previously, I was up in Hammond. Um, as you can see, we are a family uh, that lives in Crown Point and has children attend. And that smallest uh, girl there in my picture just graduated last week. So um, exciting times in the Paskus family. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. Kelly. Barker and I'm one of the vice principals at Kokomo High School. I have a little bit of a unique role. I think I supervise the special education services entirely nine to 12. Um, this year I've been able to reach down a little bit into the middle school. We'll probably talk about that in some of these points. Um, I taught for nine years and I at Kokomo High School and I have been an administrator for 12. So it's been fun to be a part of teaching, which most people say you can't do be an administrator where you taught, but it's worked out okay. So um yeah, we have a lot going on here, so. Awesome, and Kelly just shared um, with one of her teachers in the last sessions, and it was wonderful, so thank you, Kelly. Um, and last but not least, Jill Lambert. Hi, everyone. Jill Lambert, Greenwood Community Schools, finishing my third year as Director of Student Services, and 
Um, we've done quite a bit in the last um, three years that we're pretty proud of and happy to share and answer questions here in a little bit. Um, as most of you know, our superintendent um, is retiring and we hired our new superintendent, um, Terry Terhoon, um, last night from Avon. So we're really um, excited about those winds of change and we'll be sad to see Dr. DeConnick leave, but um, he's gonna enjoy um, retirement with his grandkids. So welcome everyone. Thank you all. And we are so excited to have, have this team and we're gonna just jump right in. Um, and our panelists will answer questions as it fits within their um, expertise and share each perspective um, to the panelists. Feel free to just jump in and share whichever questions fit um, and, and, and or shift and, and change it to be specific to your district. Um, so we'll start with our first question is how you emphasize the importance of inclusive practices when coaching educators who are new to students with significant disability. And, and we know new means pre-service teachers new to the field and then new um, from general to special education. So um, the emphasizing the importance of inclusive practices. I can, you just want us to jump in, Meredith? Yeah, absolutely. Yep. So just I would start, um, especially in this transition to um, new expectations for our certificate kids, we went all the way back to really taking assessment of what our teachers felt about what they believed their students could learn. So we went back to, do you believe in a core belief that all students can learn? All students, meaning even our wheelchair bound, nonverbal, students with really significant needs and what does that look like and so we wrestled with that for a month or so before we could even dig into why does what we're doing in the classroom need to look different and then how can we possibly meet the needs of our students with significant disabilities after that assessment and we did the same thing with our paras because having paras support the teachers then was almost more of a struggle than the teachers alone trying to figure out how am I going to embrace all these winds of change I think Joe you just mentioned like even with leadership changing like they felt like that in the classroom and so we started there um, and that became to emphasizing the importance and when I delivered it in a way of if you believe all students can learn then and if you don't believe all students can learn, then we need to have a conversation outside of this meeting. So they really had to decide if I can embrace that. And then we could get into more of the coaching, which made them more flexible. Thank you, Kelly. Um, really starting with that, that presumed competence piece is always mm -hmm. so key and, and you mm -hmm. highlighted that perfectly. Mm -hmm. Meredith, we in Greenwood, we started with a lot of vision and mission work um, with our teachers and our parents. Um, we did include parents in this committee. Um, we did a year long um, PLC, professional development piece. And then we partnered with Project Success, of course, but just asking our teachers what they felt were important, what they could bring um, to that essential skills experience. We rebranded our name, we call it Quest. Um, and that was something that our teachers kind of spitballed a little bit. and. Um, really, really um, put a lot of emphasis into and they own it. And everyone knows that we made signs, we made um, just all different kinds of things that we promoted throughout our school district. And then, um, you know, we invited teachers into our classrooms so that they could see what was going on. We have our Quest teachers on grade level teams. So they're doing planning with their grade level peers. Um, we have found that our Quest teachers are really, really phenomenal at the elementary level, creating schedules, collecting data, progress monitoring, and I have one teacher that leads that professional development in one of my buildings because she's just a, a domino. I mean, she's just dynamic at it. So, and I think putting those people, putting our teachers out in the forefront in front of their peers, then everyone else, you know, they see them as a leader, right? And not just someone who um, teaches six kids at one time. So, you know, they can see that the, the impact um, is spread throughout the building. So that was a small step that we took um, in, you know, to emphasize the importance of inclusive practices. Plus we backed it up with the data piece um, of least restrictive environment. I mean, I hate to really go there, but you know, when you have certain buildings that are seeing really heavy in that 52 and explaining what that continuum is to everyone who works with kids, our building principals, understanding that, 
um, it's funny how you can really change someone's mindset from, um, oh, there are 52, they have to stay in one place all day. We are really trying to break that mold. So really trying to get, and we've done that in a really, really quick um, 36 month turnaround of kids are very inclusive in the buildings, um, highly visible going out um, into gen ed classrooms. So those were a couple of things that we did to, to have some movement where I'm at currently. So can you talk about, what did you say you call them Quest teachers? Quest, uh-huh, Q-U-E-S-T. Was that an acronym or was that? It is, it, it's, I was rehearsing it this morning. It's quality, unique, <laughs> um, educational, stu or quality, unique um, experiences that are student focused and transformational. Yeah. So our, we were just trying, you know, we did one of those brain dumps and words that were important to us. And then we just kind of moved all the, the consonants around, right? And, until yeah. it made sense. But we really like the words quality and unique and transformational because we really felt we could highly individualize um, for our students in our district. And I tell you what, once you put a stamp on it, um, you know, kid, I mean, teachers just really take ownership of that. So, yeah. and, you know, I will tell, and Meredith knows our story. Um, it really helps. Those teachers are singletons typically in classroom settings and in building settings. And, you know, when you have someone that comes in and um, supports them and understands, you know, and pushes them a little bit more than what they've been pushed, I mean, their expectations just explode. They just really do. It's really yeah. neat to see. And I'd like to highlight what Jill said. I'm not sure. Uh... Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah like life skills, called life skills, and we move them to transition because life skills has the stigma that they should be in one room all day yep. and not go anywhere because they can't. Yeah. Right. I just wrote that. That was one thing that stood out um, as Jill went through this process and even to your presentation earlier, Kelly, that power of language and how, um, and Jill just emphasized it again, that power of language, how it shifts mindset. And we've talked through it with human competence, but um, as we start to look at the language that we use to, to describe students, all students, um, it starts to shift the way we, we support inclusive practices and our instructional practices alike. And, and that, that always stands out to me with that transition from life skills to quest. Um, so thank you for emphasizing that. I wanted to jump in and talk about um, looking at it through the lens of family and what it means for family to have their child included. Um, although this was a very sad event, last summer we had a um, second grade student with Rett syndrome pass away. Her parents were really ahead of their times and insisted she always be fully included and she was and she was in a building that did not have any self-contained programming. And the turnout at the celebration of her life, I mean, talk about the impact on school community that that young girl had and the impact of that for her family for those short years she was in school, um, what that meant to them for their child to belong, although she was nonverbal and wheelchair bound. Um, and we've had another instance this year um, during kind of distance learning, trials and tribulations. We have an uh, elementary student um, with some significant intellectual disabilities and, and she um, on her iPad gets FaceTime calls from her gen ed classmates. And mom was in a conference with us saying, she's upstairs right now on FaceTime with them. And just that belonging and that, um, kind of including them as the fabric of the school community, just like any other student. I think what that means to parents, I think we all inherently want to belong. Um, and it, it's just made a huge impact to share a, a family and parent perspective. Absolutely, such an important piece that we're including and being so intentional about looping in our families and, and our caregivers alike. Um, and that has, always been at the surface, but um, even more so this school year as well. So thank you for highlighting that, Heather. All right. Um, just wanted to, to kind of transition, but I had just another um, area that I wanted to kind of circle back to, and, and that is we're really looking at 
um, new teachers of, of students with significant needs, but paraprofessionals came up in that. Um, and I think that that is always an important piece that, that we're being so intentional about, we're emphasizing inclusive practices with our teachers and amongst our teams, but including them in that process as well, our paraprofessionals. Um, can any of you talk um, and touch on how you've done that um, in, in partnership with the inclusive practices? Yeah, I started with um, meeting with the para separately because I knew I really needed to acknowledge their concerns and fears before I could get them to embrace the vision because their role was changing from fun activities to academic expectations. Um, and then I really tried to focus on helping them see the importance of what they needed to do because the teacher could not do their job without them. And so it was really helping them understand how they were going to be utilized and subsiding some of their fears. And a lot of that came with just conversations and then helping the teacher understand now, how can you use your paraprofessional differently to support the academics you'll be delivering? I mean, I think all four of us, like we talk about it, like, oh, well, what just happened? But we're talking like a two, three year process that we've been on this journey um, and to reflect on now, it seems like it was yesterday, but it took a while. Absolutely. And you use the word intentional. And that is so important that we're, we're helping, helping circle back and being so um, intentional about including those paras in, in that journey. As, as Heather spoke to families, as, as Jill spoke to the teachers as well. It's such an important piece to have all those stakeholders um, right there um, at the forefront. And, and yes, it, these journeys take time and, and you all have done such a phenomenal job in that process. And for anybody embarking on this, like Heather said too, we were so intentional with teachers, paras, and parents. Everything we, every conversation we had revolved around those three groups before we could even talk about like gen ed teachers, like we did in the last session. Once we got those three on board, then we could figure out how to embrace inclusion and things like that. Yeah, thank you for highlighting that. Let's go on ahead and jump to our next question. And we've touched on it a little bit already, um, but this question revolves around what supports do you provide to facilitate the process throughout the school year? Um, we've touched on PLCs, we've touched on, you know, keeping presuming competence at the forefront. Um, can we go more specifically into the supports that are provided to new teachers um, and how we do that throughout the school year? So Meredith, I, I'll address that one. Um, we were fortunate enough four or five or six years ago to start working with Project Success on curriculum mapping. And um, the dominoes of that have been phenomenal in our corporation and it impacts new teachers in the respect that um, throughout our cooperative, often we have a, a single class in a building um, of, a, of students with disabilities. And so they're kind of on an island. And we brought those teachers together by grade level. And after that curriculum mapping, they continued to meet within their groups outside of an organized formal meeting um, set up through the special education cooperative. So I think that building that networking and collaboration has been very, very helpful, especially to new teachers. Um, we do still bring them together um, a couple times of a year. Um, and, and we do focus on our beginning first year teachers. We do a lot of more formalized um, information, but I really think they can learn so much from the, the journey that the other um, special ed teachers of students with significant disabilities have um, encountered um, so much more than they can from some of the experiences that, that I share. So that's kind of how we've addressed that. Thank you so much. And, and you touched on such an important piece. And um, traditionally, this is teachers of students with significant needs are often an island. And so as often as we can provide collaborative opportunities, we can, as, as Anne so intentionally did, and, and pulling together a curriculum mapping team um, and the power that that has led them to do that independently um, as, a, as a small group, without leadership support, but gathering and, and meeting and continuing that process 
um, that speaks so solid of, of the power of pulling teams together and providing those opportunities. Um, Jill had said, I have new teacher one-on-one -on -one meetings every two weeks. Um, we pair them with a mentor teacher um, and we do consistent walkthroughs in their classroom. So um, those walkthroughs providing that feedback, assuring that um, there's an action plan for those levels of support um, as well. Jill, you want to expand on any of that? I wasn't sure if you were still here or not. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Yes. Um, well, and with the consistent feedbacks, I know that seems, um, I don't know, just something that you should normally do, but our teachers want to know that I and the principal, that we know their kids so that when we problem solve kids and we, you know, we have to revamp IEPs that um, that we're kind of on a first name basis and they want us seeing them providing instruction. So when we come in and we look and I use my checklist and I can give that, that feedback to them while you're building a relationship with a new teacher who, um, you know, is probably vulnerable and pretty unsure of what they're doing at that time. So, um, you know, we've also partnered um, with other school districts too, Meredith, like with Ben Davis High School and had Zooms with their team as well so that they can bounce off of each other and and talk about, um, you know, just different things they're doing. Jamie at Southwest, my one quest teacher, who's, she's just a rock star, is just really connected with one of those teachers and they share lesson plans. But, um, you know, we're, it's just that consistent, visible person in their classroom um, so that we can see the kids, help them. Um, you know, I do a lot of coaching on how to talk to parents, um, you know, provide, like you talked about Meredith, especially with those inclusive practices, because sometimes our parents are pretty leery of their kids leaving the classroom as well you know, and who's going to watch my child and who's going to be there one-on-one -on -one and why all of a sudden all this independence. So some of that is, um, you know, when you talk about supports, I, I don't think we should forget about, you know, the data we send home, how we communicate to those parents, right? Um, and when we do send that home, we prepare for feedback from parents as well. You know, and how does a first year, I think about if we're talking about new educators or current educators, how do we respond to that in a very respectful manner, right? That communicates, you know, our care and compassion for our students. So, um, you know, those are just some of the things and they seem very minimal, but those little minimal consistent things add up over time. It's, they don't want me or a principal coming in for the big happy moments. They want us there on a very regular consistent basis, right? Absolutely. And you, and, and one thing that I know Jill has done just very intentionally is connecting teachers and you had mentioned your quest group um and and i know that that team meets through professional learning communities throughout the school year um and pulling together for for various levels of pd provided you know by project success or patents but internally as well having those conversations having um that on a regular basis um to lose the island approach um, and the other piece is connecting to other districts. And, and Jill touched on it, but that teacher went and walked through another classroom at, an, at a different district building. So just that power of connectivity um, is so important. And, and having that mentorship between teachers is essential as well. So I just wanted to highlight that because I've seen that, that in action with those educators and know the impact as well. Anything, anything else to touch on here around that year-long process um, and supports and services that are provided? I would just highlight, again, a lot of what they've already said, just because it's so important that they're um, pairing with some gen ed teachers. Hope we lost you here, Kelly. I got muted. Did you hear any of that? Just the pairing so, with gen ed teachers. Yeah, so when they felt like I didn't have to reinvent the wheel as well as keep track of everything that the students' individuals' needs were, it provided a little bit of relief, but it also helped enable those relationships to form. So when we introduced the content connectors, I wrote down some notes and thought, I, we, I just flooded them with resources. Heidi was, um, Project Success was instrumental in that because they never felt like they were alone having to figure this out, but it too is consistent walkthroughs. It's getting in their classroom. We no longer have an atmosphere of, oh no, there's an administrator in my room, but hey, what'd you think about that? I was trying this today. And so it's great to switch that, um, really the expectation when people come in to getting feedback instead of just criticism. Absolutely. And, and that partnership throughout that, that, um, that collaborative partnership. Um, thank you, Kelly. I appreciate it. 
Um, and then Jill added a couple of other areas in the chat box. So um, there's a Quest leadership program that's highlighted at the high school, at Greenwood High School, um, where we have, um, you know, we have typical developing peers as well as students with disabilities um, attending the classes in extracurricular. So um, I just wanted to highlight that that is in the chat box and, and just an important piece to what um, everyone has spoken to so far as well. Um, all right, so let's jump over here um, and really talk specifics here and how we're providing professional development, but more specifically, you know, how is professional development provided for new teachers? And then what might be some of the topics that you feel like you need to highlight um, very intentionally and that you embed throughout the school year? So how is professional development provided? And then what is the professional development that is being provided? I would say uh, as a result of COVID, this was actually a, a good thing that came out of it is we stayed distance learning every Wednesday, which allowed for us to have a nice block of time for vertical and horizontal articulation with um, groups of types of teachers and then as well as our new teachers. So um, that'll be something we'll keep up you know, in some form or fashion once um, we come back to a traditional school year. Um, and then there's also a very robust uh, teacher mentorship program here in Crown Point. Um, every teacher goes through 14 days of new teacher orientation before school starts. And um, they have monthly meetings throughout the school year um, where we're included as a department as necessary depending on the types of teachers that have been hired for the year. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. The that, that 14 days is incredible um, that that's allocated to, to new, new educators. We have similar, um, it's a TOPS program. It's five days prior to, um, and then we have now we include like with our students, our special ed teachers and all of the general education professional development, we do um, kind of, our students with significant needs, the reality is their planning and services look different. So when we break out into PLCs, they meet every other week. Um, they, those transition teachers have time to meet together to review their curriculum maps, to review the teaching in the classroom, how are their needs being met? Is, is there anything in services that need to be different? So they know they have time together to go through and problem solve, but the professional development that was critical was making sure they were familiar with the content connectors, the curriculum maps, and then how, what does that look like in the classroom? Viability grouping, because we kind of had to go back to the basics, right? We've been used to working in groups and having fun, how do we keep it fun, focus on transition, and include academics into that? We shouldn't lose any of those things because we're raising the academic expectations. Absolutely. Um, and, and you touched on, on a couple of key elements, but having that the curriculum map ahead of our teachers gives a sense of, um, they can kind of ease into what those expectations are. And I know for the curriculum, for the instruction. And I know you, many of you, all of you on this group has really delved into that and, and made that a priority. Um, identifying those critical alternate standards, we call them content connectors here in Indiana, making sure that you've aligned curriculum that aligns directly to teaching that content connect connector, the assessment strategies to use, um, um, common assessments that need to be utilized as well. It's such um, a, an essential piece to helping support our teachers as well. Um, anything else on the professional development that's provided? I would only share that um, we have also discovered a need to provide professional development to our administrators. Um, in our setup, we don't evaluate this, the, these new teachers. And so once we did our curriculum mapping and our expectations and, and um, so forth, we needed to and continue to try to provide professional development. Um, we're looking at doing a principal's roundtable in our cooperative starting this fall, just to continue to give them um, opportunities to ask questions about expectations and, and special education and um, 
to understand our expectations as well. Yeah, absolutely. That is such an essential component is, is having um, our all administrators um, understand what is expected um, to have the presumed competence as well. Um, if, if you don't have a background in special education, we have to bridge that gap and, and helping to embrace the all and making sure that those pieces are um, in place at the leadership level as we as we go into the classroom level as well. Thank you, Anne. That is so important. Um, it really is. Oh, sorry. Can I add to that? Because yep. Anne, I'm glad you brought that up because I my position is unique in that I am the building level administrator that gets to work with all of this, which I consider a real privilege. Um, and I've been able to work with middle schools and not every building principal, like you said, most don't have the same level of knowledge or expertise to own all of this. And so as we've worked, I have realized how important it is to really be a resource, but also kind of start at the beginning and say, how can we help the principals understand why this is important? And, and for other administrators, um, I would just encourage you to be as bold as you can respectfully about why this is important because in a meeting, um, very anonymously, the principal was trying to help the teacher. It was a different building and I don't have any evaluation role there. I was just simply, there's a resource. And he was really just trying to help the teacher. Totally believe that. And I just had to say, that's okay. If this is how you wanna do it, then I just need to exit because what we do we have to do with some authenticity and we have to ensure that what we're saying we're doing, we're doing. It can't just be on paper and going through and helping him kind of check. And when he, as soon as he realized what he said, he felt terrible because he didn't realize what he was saying meant minimizing the process. Well, what we really have to do is make sure that we're doing this in a way that brings the dignity and respect and raises the expectation for our kids. So the difficult conversations can be extremely rewarding, I think, as administrators, as we're helping peers. Absolutely. And, and the power of coaching, um, you know, I'm, I'm even thinking through those case conference decisions. In Indiana, we go through four guiding questions for the alternate assessment um, and, and training our principals and assistant principals that are uh, providing and, and sharing those meetings to understand the language, to understand the communication around the four guiding questions, and to assure that we are applying high expectations um, throughout the process is so essential. And it's been something that, you know, I know everyone on, on this panel has worked through with principals. Um, and I would imagine many of you attending today have, have gone through similar conversations and similar trainings as well. Um, so thank you for highlighting that. That's just such an important element as well. Um, let's go ahead and, and jump to this last question. And then I want to open it up for any questions that uh, our attendees may have for each one of our experts here today. So um, essential takeaway, if you could provide just one essential takeaway for coaches, for administrators of new, uh, new teachers of, of students with significant needs, what would it be and why? I think mine would be um, continue to learn, to grow, to improve, to push yourself and your students um, beyond what you think is possible. Um, I think that there are so many um, shades of gray with this population of students that you're never going to have one um, program that fits all of your students. And so remembering that our students are more often than not limited by the adults that serve them instead of their own abilities, I think is um, what I would suggest as the, the key takeaways from today. Wow, yeah, absolutely. Limited by the adults that serve them. Um, and, and that is so in, important. And, and why presumed competence is presented at every one of our panels and why we, we bring all of you along to help champion that. Thank you, Anne. I, I would add um, that for a takeaway that when you start this process, document every little win because those success stories is what's going to win people over to really share and support the vision 
Um, because we talk about it like it's a passion, right? But what we know is now it's law and the rights of all of these students. And so we, we won't really win by jamming it down people's throats. But backing all the way up to K-12 over time, as people see that raising the, expectation, raising the expectation means that our kids are accomplishing more, keep documentation of those wins and share those every chance you get. Because of your work, this student was able to dot, dot, dot. Perfect. Thank you. I also see uh, principals who intentionally frame those quick wins for new teachers to help build that confidence. And it gives them um, the strength to kind of keep fighting the good fight, you know, not to give up on our students and to, you know, some of our folks haven't really worked with general educators before. So to put themselves out on a ledge to approach you know, these general educators, they don't know um, about including students or working with our students. Um, I think just being intentional of how we set up um, their roadmap for their first school year and, and give them an opportunity for success. Absolutely. And amplifying that. Yeah, that's so that is so essential um, to make sure that we're we're celebrating that with our educators. We talk about celebrating small wins with our students, but also with our, our teachers and keeping that in the forefront of, of all that we all that we do and all that we share with our teachers. Thank you for, for highlighting that. Um, I want to open up the line. If, if there are questions, please add those to the chat box um, directly for, for Kelly, Ian, or Um, as well. So feel free to, to ask questions and um, make sure that that you can also unmute if you feel comfortable um, sharing that out as well. And why we why we wait for people to to kind of type in and, and add um, add some information, um, Ian Kelly or Heather, do you want to talk? All of you you mentioned curriculum mapping. Do you want to talk just a little bit about how that process worked? I know it's um, diverse between the three of you, but there's some common ground there as well, and you all highlighted that as an area of um, just a, a big impact on your new educators. Do you want to talk about how specifically how you got started with that process and any key takeaways along curriculum mapping, unpacking, et cetera? Well, when we, um, we started with the professional development with Project Success, and then we literally just had to go ask for the curriculum map. And we were doing that in the general education classes anyway for Kokomo High School to kind of bring everything back together. So it, the teachers shared those with our special ed teachers, and it was very overwhelming because they cover so many standards. So we really had to break them down into the power standards or pick. Um, we started with what teachers were most passionate in teaching. I wanted to make sure that the subjects and things that they would enjoy more because it was intimidating to them. Even though they're students with significant disabilities, they were going back to an academic component that had been missing. And some of my teachers had been here for quite some time. So we just had to break it down into really manageable. And sometimes it was literally long one-on-one -on -one meetings with them On here. to help them break it down and then break down each power standard. And once one teacher on the team got it, they could start doing it together, but that that was very intentionally it started. We had Project Success, Ashley from Project Success come and work with us. Um, and what kind of prompted it was we were teaching 
the same thing over and over and over. And there wasn't a lot of variety in the academic mm -hmm. instruction that was being provided. So we were able to um, unpack the standards and then we took it the next step, which was, okay, we can't stay on some of the standards. We, we know we want to teach all year long, but that can't be all of the standards. We need to continue to move and push our students because of their unique um, learning styles. They might understand or grasp one concept quick, more quickly than another. And so, um, but again, when my, when my teachers, after we had our big meeting, they broke it down and they, they went into their teams and they, they spent hours on of their own time working on this and, and I couldn't be prouder of the outcomes that we have um, as a result of the time that they've put into it. I love it. Just that that initiative there as well. Um, I want to jump in because there was a question here in the chat box. Um, as leaders, what is one thing you would uh, recommend for staff and teacher retention? I would say support and whatever that support may be. You know, is it writing IEPs? Is it classroom management, lesson planning, working with related service providers, working with parents, you know, just touching base with them on a, on a consistent basis. And um, my direct, my assistant director and myself are intentional about both of us being um, present for them, you know, popping in on their classroom um, and then giving them that go-to person in their building, whether it's the department chair or their mentor teacher, um, so that they do feel like they have places to turn for help. And, and I feel like most people just want to know someone has their back. And um, we're, we try to really provide that for them. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. All right, we are to two minutes. So we want to keep the chat box open. If you have anything that you would like um, Ian, Heather um, or Kelly to answer, it is it is there for you to continue to um, ask. And Heather and Ian and Kelly, if you guys wouldn't mind just adding your email address to the chat box, um, I think that that would be really helpful. If there are other questions, that's a space to, to go and to get additional information. Um, additionally, um, Mary has added the evaluation in the chat box. So you have that and we would love to hear back from you on all of our sessions, but especially this one. So please jump in and, and share um, and, and we'll value that feedback. That's also, as, as Mary mentioned, how you get your professional growth points. I want to thank Ian and Jill and Kelly and Heather so much for your time today. Um, not only with this session, but uh, your, your valiant efforts in your district to, to really provide equity and access for students with significant needs. Um, it is phenomenal to see the growth in those districts because of these leaders. Um, and, and it is directly because they support their teachers in such a way that allows their teachers to excel. Um, so thank you. And thank you for your, your time and energy and expertise today. Um, with that, I just wanted to share a couple of things as we jump into summer. Project Success is gearing up for 21-22 and, and some of the offerings that we'll have in the new school year. So I will be meeting with administrators on June 14th and July 7th to talk through these offerings, um, to walk you through um, a tool that we use called Playbook. Um, we have one for Project Success and supporting uh, teachers of students with significant needs. We also have one for the high leverage practices. So if you um, would like to join one of those demos, I should also mention that following this session at noon, um, Amy Howie and myself are gonna jump in and share what Playbook is and really get a feel for what you need in your district. So we're available to continue those conversations and really target and form those questions around your needs. So if you wanna hop into Sketch and join us um, Using that Zoom link, it'll be um, noon Eastern time here in just a few minutes um, to learn more about those offerings and how Project Success and Public Consulting Group can support your district. Um, I will also encourage you to explore our new Teacher Jumpstart. We're excited about this. Um, it fits to all the components that this group has just spoken to, um, really starting with how do we support new teachers and then how do we get them the foundational skills that they need to go into their district and be successful alongside their district administrators. So we are offering a new teacher jumpstart on the 18th and 19th of August. Um, those are half day sessions and we would love to give you more information 
It is all on our website under upcoming events. Um, and then we'll be coaching um, as we always do. We're gonna coach another group of teacher leaders um, in the new year, um, new school year. And we're gonna coach um, any new and veteran teachers alike that aren't ready for our new teacher, our teacher leadership program. So um, we would love to talk to you more about those offerings um, through uh, our noon um, conversation with Amy and myself. Um, but we encourage you to go on our website and learn more as well. And as always, please go on ahead and share with us. We so appreciate your time um, this, this last couple of days. I know many of you have been on um, all day yesterday and part of today. And so we appreciate you. We appreciate your engagement. Um, our team was just reflecting um, last night and then today how engaged, how engaged our participants have been and how um, you're providing great feedback in those session evaluations. And so we appreciate your level of engagement. We know um, this year has been extremely trying um, and for you to show up on your own time to help support students with significant disabilities is always such an important piece and, and, and really exemplifies who you are as, as teachers and leaders in your own building. So continue to engage with us, but please do so through our Twitter or our Facebook. We wanna hear from you. Um, I will also put um, Ashley Quick and myself's email addresses in the chat box. Um, Ashley planned all of our summer training. Um, so if you have any questions, you can reach out directly to her or myself and we will get you the information that you need. Um, just as another reminder, all of our sessions will go up as recordings onto our website. Um, as soon as we get the, the time and energy that tomorrow to get those uploaded, they will be there. So please share them with your colleagues. Um, if you need further training or a conversation around it, please reach out to us. Um, if that's something district level, why do we need to be helping support your teams? We want to be there for you. So please let us know how we can further support you. Um, and if not, I've gone over by two whole minutes. So thank you for your time. Um, and I'll see some of you here in about eight minutes um, to learn a little bit more about our professional development. But if not, have a wonderful day and please stay in touch with us. We would love to hear from you. We would love to see and hear your success stories as well. Thank you all. I'll hang out here if there are questions, as will my teams.